I begin, I'd like to announce the release of two new books, 500 page picture documentary. It's going to be released in this month. Takes you far beyond the Candriana. I would like to read to you the dedication of this book. I freed my mind from captivity as I believe in the freedom of thoughts. I have no desire for recognition because I have no ego. On the plane I live, there is peace and comfort. My work is for the children yet to be born. In a healthy free society, the mental and physical freedom is a prerequisite for progress. In a decadent and oppressive societies, when the mental freedom is curtailed, the physical will explode. While the physical freedom is curtailed, the mental will take off. I came to the United States 1957 from the East. I spent six and a half years in concentration camp with some of the top scientists of the world to build the East. I worked for major corporations as an electrical engineer or electronic engineer in the United States. And my last job was with Boston Jordan and Anaconda as a project coordinator on the Texas Gulf Software Copper Refinery in Timmins, Ontario. When I finished that project, I started my own company back in 1965. And by 1968, I had the first practical called fusion going, producing half isotopes. I built accelerators for a few hundred dollars what our government spends billions to build. I used high-purity metal crystals to rearrange the grains into simple geometrical form, opening up the domain, creating microcapillaries with superconductive properties. That's what led me into to the first cold fusion, and the byproduct came out of that called the pentoxyhydrate, which was classified in 1974 for some time. In 1977, I announced to the world that the energy crisis is over, and I went on national television in the United States, and I demonstrated to the Department of Energy of practical cold fusion and miniature suns, miniature hydrogen bombs, produced on a hot plate. I produced so much free energy from 300 Fahrenheit, increasing it to hundreds of millions of degrees centigrade temperature to creating the miniature hydrogen bomb from free energy. The free energy was derived from the atmosphere, the static field. The reason I'm telling you this because it's all interrelating to my work. I left the country in 1982 and went to Antwerp while I was doing research on producing synthetic diamonds. And during this course of work, in conjunction with Rocks University, I discovered when I replaced carbon with nitrogen in the diamond lattice isomorphously, I created that energy transducer. An energy transducer with the light carbon oscillating around the heavier nitrogen was capable of producing enough energy that I was able to reverse the spin of the proton. Now, later when I came back to the United States and I retired in 1985, in my retirement, I pursued the search of connection between free energy and life. I was in and out of researching plants, plant lives, 
and I was fascinated by the delivery system within the capillaries of the plants, how the root system of the plants draw on free energy from the atmosphere, from static field, which acts as a pump to pump the fluid up in the capillaries. During this course of work, I also found that the cross-section of the capillaries and the number of capillaries in the root system is directly proportional to the atmospheric pressure, to the static charge of the air, and the conductivity of the air, which of course is moist, the water content. Now this also explains why trees doesn't grow on high elevation. We have plenty of energy, but we have no conductivity. And why the trees are tall at sea level, and why the plants are much healthier at sea level. Now, I'd like to stop here for a moment and take you back in time when the universe was born from the big bank, the big burst of energy. From that free energy which is moving through time and space, filling a giant bubble with free energy. I call it the energy of creation. And there is nothing wrong with it to call it the breath of God. 918 pairs of scrolls of this free energy is braided into a static field which we call photons. That's the way life was born. 918 pairs of these photons braided into one electron, and 918 pairs of electrons braided into one neutron, and that's the way light was molded into matter. By losing one electron, we gained the proton, and that one electron is orbiting around the positive hydrogen to make the atom of hydrogen. This hydrogen, at enormous pressure, forms metallic hydrogen, and this hydrogen, this metallic hydrogen, is filling the cores of suns and stars. And during the lifetime of the sun, this metallic hydrogen is the fuel which is burning, fusing together to forming heavier elements and make way the creation of planets which are broke out of the sun. All planets have been broken out from suns and stars. When our planet broke out from the sun, the reason we have to see, because we broke out at a time when the fusion was at a point we produced, or the sun was producing a lot of, the fusing a lot of silicon and a lot of aluminum, and those formed stable hydrides, bringing home the sea. And that's, why, that's how our planet brought the water out of the sun. Now when the sun burns out, it turns into a red star. If it cools down, it will explode. It will shed its electrons and give birth to a neutron star, and that neutron star will go down a black hole, breaking down to free energy, to filling the great balloon recycling, like everything else throughout the whole universe, is constantly recycling. 